Lesson 9 The Church and Education Sabbath Afternoon November 21 In the early church, Christianity was taught in its purity. Its precepts were given by the voice of inspiration. Its ordinances were uncorrupted by the device of men. The church revealed the Spirit of Christ and appeared beautiful in its simplicity. Its adorning was the holy principles and exemplary lives of its members. Multitudes were won to Christ not by display or learning, but by the power of God which attended the plain preaching of His Word. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 166. As the disciples proclaimed the completeness of Christ, the risen Savior, their words moved hearts, and men and women were won to the gospel. Multitudes who had reviled the Savior's name and despised His power now confessed themselves disciples of the crucified. Not in their own power did the apostles accomplish their mission, but in the power of the living God. Their work was not easy. The opening labors of the Christian church were attended by hardship and bitter grief. In their work, the disciples constantly encountered privation, calumny, and persecution. But they counted not their lives dear unto themselves and rejoiced that they were called to suffer for Christ. Irresolution, indecision, weakness of purpose found no place in their efforts. They were willing to spend and be spent. The consciousness of the responsibility resting on them purified and enriched their experience, and the grace of heaven was revealed in the conquests they achieved for Christ. With the might of omnipotence, God worked through them to make the gospel triumphant. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 594 and 595. In the church at home, the children are to learn to pray and to trust in God. Teach them to repeat God's law. Concerning the commandments the Israelites were instructed, Thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7 Come in humility with a heart full of tenderness and with a sense of the temptations and dangers before yourselves and your children. By faith, bind them to the altar, entreating for them the care of the Lord. Train the children to offer their simple words of prayer. Tell them that God delights to have them call upon Him. Will the Lord of heaven pass by such homes and leave no blessing there? Nay, verily. Ministering angels will guard the children who are thus dedicated to God. They hear the offering of praise and the prayer of faith, and they bear the petitions to Him who ministers in the sanctuary for His people and offers His merits in their behalf. Counsels to Parents, Teachers, and Students, page 110. Sunday, November 22. True Christian Education What is pure religion? Christ has told us that pure religion is the exercise of pity, sympathy, and love in the home, in the church, and in the world. This is the kind of religion to teach the children and is the genuine article. Teach them that they are not to center their thoughts upon themselves, but that wherever there is human need and suffering, there is a field for missionary work. Let the home be made a place for religious instruction. Let parents become mouthpieces of the Lord God of Israel to teach the precepts of true Christianity and let them be examples of what the principles of love can make men and women. Reflecting Christ, page 252. We are to think and care for others who need our love, our tenderness, and care. We should ever remember that we are representatives of Christ and that we are to share the blessings that He gives, not with those who can recompense us again, but with those who will appreciate the gifts that will supply their temporal and spiritual necessities. Those who give feasts for the purpose of helping those who have but little pleasure, for the purpose of bringing brightness into their dreary lives, for the purpose of relieving their poverty and distress, are acting unselfishly and in harmony with the instruction of Christ. Advent Review and Sabbath Herald, November 12, 1895 We may claim to be followers of Christ. We may claim to believe every truth in the Word of God. 
but this will do our neighbor no good unless our belief is carried into our daily life. Our profession may be as high as heaven, but it will save neither ourselves nor our fellow men unless we are Christians. A right example will do more to benefit the world than all our profession. By no selfish practices can the cause of Christ be served. His cause is the cause of the oppressed and the poor. In the hearts of his professed followers there is need of the tender sympathy of Christ, a deeper love for those whom he has so valued as to give his own life for their salvation. These souls are precious, infinitely more precious than any other offering we can bring to God. To bend every energy towards some apparently great work while we neglect the needy or turn the stranger from his right is not a service that will meet his approval. Love is the basis of godliness. Whatever the profession, no man has pure love to God unless he has unselfish love for his brother. But we can never come into possession of this spirit by trying to love others. What is needed is the love of Christ in the heart. When self is merged in Christ, love springs forth spontaneously. The completeness of Christian character is attained when the impulse to help and bless others springs constantly from within, when the sunshine of heaven fills the heart and is revealed in the countenance. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 383 and 384. Monday, November 23 Called to Live as Light The followers of Christ are to be the light of the world, but God does not bid them make an effort to shine. He does not approve of any self-satisfied endeavor to display superior goodness. He desires that their souls shall be imbued with the principles of heaven. Then as they come in contact with the world, they will reveal the light that is in them. Their steadfast fidelity in every act of life will be a means of illumination. In choosing men and women for His service, God does not ask whether they possess worldly wealth, learning, or eloquence. He asks, Do they walk in such humility that I can teach them my way? Can I put my words into their lips? Will they represent me? God can use every person just in proportion as He can put His Spirit into the soul temple. The work that He will accept is the work that reflects His image. His followers are to bear as their credentials to the world the ineffaceable characteristics of His immortal principles. The Ministry of Healing, pages 36 and 37 it is not possible for the heart in which Christ abides to be destitute of love. If we love God because He first loved us, we shall love all for whom Christ died. We cannot come in touch with divinity without coming in touch with humanity. For in Him who sits upon the throne of the universe, divinity and humanity are combined. Connected with Christ, we are connected with our fellow men by the golden links of the chain of love. Then the pity and compassion of Christ will be manifest in our life. We shall not wait to have the needy and unfortunate brought to us. We shall not need to be entreated to feel for the woes of others. It will be as natural for us to minister to the needy and suffering as it was for Christ to go about doing good. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 384 and 385 Christ pointed out the position his people should occupy when he said, Ye are the light of the world. From the members of the church there is to go forth an influence which shall enlighten others. The light giver arranges the lamp so that all in his house, the world, may be enlightened. He has an inexhaustible supply of light, and he places those who truly believe in him where they will shine brighter and brighter. Constantly our light is to increase in brightness because we are constantly receiving light from the source of all light. Beholding Christ, we are to become changed into His image, reflecting His light to the world. Each soul united to Christ becomes a light in God's house. Each is to receive and impart, letting His light shine forth in clear bright rays. We are held responsible by God if we do not let light shine to those who are in darkness. God has given each member of His Church the work of giving light to the world, and those who faithfully act their part in this work will receive an increasing supply of light to impart. 
By his spirit, the Lord will mold and fashion the human agent, quickening his energies and giving him light wherewith to enlighten others. Reflecting Christ, page 197. Tuesday, November 24. Living as Disciples. The world today is in crying need of a revelation of Christ Jesus in the person of his saints. God desires that his people shall stand before the world a holy people. Why? Because there is a world to be saved by the light of gospel truth, and as the message of truth that is to call men out of darkness into God's marvelous light is given by the church, the lives of its members, sanctified by the Spirit of truth, are to bear witness to the verity of the messages proclaimed. The world is in need of a demonstration of practical Christianity. In view of the fact that those who claim to be followers of Christ are a spectacle to an unbelieving world, it behooves them to make sure that they are in right relation to God. In order to stand as lights in the world, they need to have the clear light of the Son of Righteousness constantly shining upon them. In Heavenly Places, page 313. No matter how high the profession, he whose heart is not filled with love for God and his fellow men is not a true disciple of Christ. Though he should possess great faith and have power even to work miracles, yet without love his faith would be worthless. He might display great liberality, but should he, from some other motive than genuine love, bestow all his goods to feed the poor, the act would not commend him to the favor of God. In his zeal he might even meet a martyr's death, yet if not actuated by love, he would be regarded by God as a deluded enthusiast or an ambitious hypocrite. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 318 and 319. Communion with Christ, how unspeakably precious! Such communion it is our privilege to enjoy if we will seek it, if we will make any sacrifice to secure it. When the early disciples heard the words of Christ, they felt their need of Him. They sought, they found, they followed Him. They were with Him in the house, at the table, in the closet, in the field. They were with Him as pupils with a teacher, daily receiving from His lips lessons of holy truth. They looked to Him as servants to their Master, to learn their duty. They served Him cheerfully, gladly. They followed Him as soldiers follow their commander, fighting the good fight of faith. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Conformity to Jesus will not be unobserved by the world. It is a subject of notice and comment. The Christian may not be conscious of the great change, for the more closely he resembles Christ in character, the more humble will be his opinion of himself. But it will be seen and felt by all around him. Those who have had the deepest experience in the things of God are the farthest removed from pride or self-exaltation. They have the humblest thoughts of self and the most exalted conceptions of the glory and excellence of Christ. They feel that the lowest place in His service is too honorable for them. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, page 223. Wednesday November 25. Seeking Truth. The words spoken to the disciples are spoken also to us. The Comforter is ours as well as theirs. The Spirit furnishes the strength that sustains striving, wrestling souls in every emergency amidst the hatred of the world and the realization of their own failures and mistakes. In sorrow and affliction, when the outlook seems dark and the future perplexing, and we feel helpless and alone, these are the times when, in answer to the prayer of faith, the Holy Spirit brings comfort to the heart. It is not essential for us to be able to define just what the Holy Spirit is. Christ tells us that the Spirit is the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, which proceedeth from the Father. It is plainly declared regarding the Holy Spirit that, in His work of guiding men into all truth, He shall not speak of Himself. John chapter 15 verse 26 and chapter 16 verse 13. The nature of the Holy Spirit is a mystery. Men cannot explain it because the Lord has not revealed it to them. 
Men having fanciful views may bring together passages of Scripture and put a human construction on them, but the acceptance of these views will not strengthen the church. Regarding such mysteries, which are too deep for human understanding, silence is golden. The Acts of the Apostles, pages 51 and 52. The Comforter is called the Spirit of Truth. His work is to define and maintain the truth. He first dwells in the heart as the Spirit of Truth, and thus he becomes the Comforter. There is comfort and peace in the truth, but no real peace or comfort can be found in falsehood. It is through false theories and traditions that Satan gains his power over the mind. By directing men to false standards, he misshapes the character. Through the scriptures, the Holy Spirit speaks to the mind and impresses truth upon the heart. Thus he exposes error and expels it from the soul. It is by the Spirit of Truth, working through the Word of God, that Christ subdues His chosen people to Himself. God intends that even in this life the truths of His Word shall be ever unfolding to His people. There is only one way in which this knowledge can be obtained. We can attain to an understanding of God's Word only through the illumination of that Spirit by which the Word was given. The things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 11 and 10. God's Amazing Grace, page 199. I am encouraged and blessed as I realize that the God of Israel is still guiding His people and that He will continue to be with them even to the end. If ever there was a time when we needed the special guidance of the Holy Spirit, it is now. We need a thorough consecration. It is fully time that we gave to the world a demonstration of the power of God in our own lives and in our ministry. God's Amazing Grace, page 200. Thursday, November 26. Sharing Our Lives we meet together to edify one another by an interchange of thoughts and feelings, to gather strength and light and courage by becoming acquainted with one another's hopes and aspirations. And by our earnest heartfelt prayers offered up in faith, we receive refreshment and vigor from the source of our strength. These meetings should be most precious seasons. All have not the same experience in their religious life. But those of diverse exercises come together and with simplicity and humbleness of mind talk out their experience. All who are pursuing the onward Christian course should have, and will have, an experience that is living, that is new and interesting. A living experience is made up of daily trials, conflicts and temptations, strong efforts and victories, and great peace and joy gained through Jesus. A simple relation of such experiences gives light, strength, and knowledge that will aid others in their advancement in the divine life. Educate your mind to love the Bible, to love the prayer meeting, to love the hour of meditation, and above all, the hour when the soul communes with God. In Heavenly Places, page 91. When Christ called his disciples from their fishing nets, he told them that they were to be fishers of men. By this Christ meant that they were to work. In communicating the truth to others, they were to cast their nets on the right side of the ship. By this Christ meant that they were to work in faith to save souls. And this work for individuals would, in the providence of God, lead them to work for communities. They were not to think themselves part of different systems of work, but individual threads of the great whole, inseparably united, like links in a chain, connected with their fellow men and with God. This Day with God, page 253. Let little companies meet together to study the scriptures. You will lose nothing by this, but will gain much. Angels of God will be in your gathering, and as you feed upon the bread of life, you will receive spiritual sinew and muscle. You will be feeding, as it were, upon the leaves of the tree of life. By this means only can you maintain your integrity. Fidelity to Jesus Christ will ensure a most precious reward. Let each soul strive for eternal life, acknowledging Christ in word and spirit. He has pledged his word that he will acknowledge you and me, gladly, 
heartily, joyously before his heavenly Father. Is not this worth striving for? See what you can do personally to be true to principle, to maintain uncorruptness in every phase of your life, and you will behold his glory. This Day with God, page 11. Christ's gracious presence in his word is ever speaking to the soul, representing him as the well of living water to refresh the thirsting soul. It is our privilege to have a living, abiding Savior. He is the source of spiritual power implanted within us, and his influence will flow forth in words and actions, refreshing all within the sphere of our influence, begetting in them desires and aspirations for strength and purity, for holiness and peace, and for that joy which brings no sorrow with it. This is the result of an indwelling Savior. Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 390. For further reading, In Heavenly Places, Our Mission to the World, page 312, and God's Amazing Grace, Our Personal Guide, page 201.